with me now. And then at the back end, it's not in your, it's not in the notes, but it says, receive with meekness the implanted word. So he frames this to us because this is going to be a challenge today. Not for you easygoing, fun-loving people, but for the rest of us. But he frames how to do this with the Bible. It's always been God's word that helps us. My prayer life is me communicating with him. His word is his communicating back with me. We've always needed the Bible. Listen, if you're trying to live from that superstar moment, that miracle moment when you got saved and walk out your life with sanctification, and the only time you do it is, is when you come here for uh, an hour and a half and my 20, oh, the clock's not ticking. That means I get to go as far as I can today. That's great. Oh, now, look, at it, speeding it up. Hey, um, uh, if you're trying to do it in a 40-minute uh, period, or not, you're going you're gonna to be miserable. In fact, you'd be more miserable than it. You, know, you, you might get some splash-over blessings from others, and it, but you're going to be miserable, and you're going to make people around you miserable too. So this whole thing about what we're talking about is framed with eat the word, get the word in you. It's the word that changes you. You need the word. I need the word, the word, the word, the word, the word. Because, because we've got this other stuff. And I don't have time to get into it. I'm just going to eliminate it because of just get, we're getting influenced by We've got to be influenced by the Word of God. Or if we're not, we're going to fail miserably with our marriages, with our friendships. Relations, we're going to fail because other things are influencing us. Amen? Just me, not you, but me. You know. So pray for me, all right, while I preach this, all right? But so we're going to get it. And even if you try not to, which, which we, there's wisdom teaching on how to try not to, you know, who you hang around with, what, you know, choices you make, you're still gonna, you're still gonna get it because it's flying around, and people say things, and we, we're exposed to things. But let's get to the, let's. How about we get to the two verses for today? A, 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 a two verse sermon. This ought to be a short one. You would think, wouldn't you? Only two verses. Let's see if we can do this. Pray for me. So then, having talked about needing the word, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak. Slow to wrath, for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. What, what makes you angry like this guy? Slap that up there, Pastor Seth. You ever see that? You ever toss a racket? Huh? We have a, ten, uh, we have a, a star tennis player here today. You've tossed a racket as good as you are? I'm too cheap to toss a racket. All right, I'm not going to, uh, yeah. I'm not doing that. I don't have mo mom and dad buying me rackets, okay? So I look at Sue. Yeah, it's true. I know. How about did you ever uh, throw your glove down in the, in the field there or toss a basketball, pound something, you know? I mean, this stuff is all foreign to me because I'm easygoing and fun-loving, but some people, you know? And by the way, just to be clear, those of you who've known me a long time and known when I, my son and daughters were playing sports, that was community service. I was helping out the referees, and I never got a dime for that bill. That was me just helping. And then, I, and then I was also an umpire, so I really felt funny. But we respond to disappointments or maybe a, an umpire that was out of place and made a poor call or just the fact that we knew we could have done better, and we respond to it sometimes in a way that is inappropriate. We could all say that, I mean, look at that racket. Yeah, I don't think he's going to be playing with that anytime soon. You know, maybe highlight. Um, but what I'm trying to say is I wonder what he thinks and I don't know who that is and probably better off, but if I could snapshot some pictures in my life the way I responded inappropriately, when I think about those, I have regrets. I have regrets. It was, a, it was the idea that, you know, that what happened or what was said to me or what I think was done to me or was uh, how someone mishandled my, my kids, I reacted. And, and, and I've asked you to pray for me. I've told you this, that if with my grandchildren... And I want to give you full warning, because I want you to come visit me in jail. If I ever go on a field and some six-foot-four guy comes pounding down the line and knocks my granddaughter off second base trying to make a tag into the outfield, I'm probably going to spend some time in jail ministry. I'm, you know, in fact, it won't get there, because when he's on first base, I'll probably be out on the field. Now, I'm not taking pride in that. I'm just not going to let that happen. I'm not going to let some big bruiser hurt my little baby, sweet baby girl granddaughter, because he shouldn't be out there. That's not politics. That's genetics. That's DNA. That's fairness, right, Mike? So I'm sitting here on this side of anger saying, Lord, help me. I don't want to do anything to hurt my witness. 
but I'm not going to let anybody hurt my granddaughters. Now, my grandsons, who I love dearly, they're just going to have to fend for themselves. Because I've been on the, playing shortstop before in eighth grade, and I've, I was not the biggest kid on the team. And I've had bigger guys come down and knock me into the left field. But that was guys with guys. So I got my little weak area, my Achilles heel, that I'm looking forward to saying, God, prepare me. I don't want to say anything to hurt my witness. And you have something, too. Some of you, you're not, you don't want pastor in the car when you're making your commute. Somebody cuts you off and you cast them into the lake of fire. I don't think them cutting you off should cause them to lose their salvation and be cast in the lake of fire, nor should it cause you to lose your salvation. So if you're having trouble, just pick me up on your way to work and I'll ride with you. Coffee on me. Let's see if we can get this thing in, in hand. Now, I know 131's been a challenge for some of you, but, you know, just be patient. So we know we've taken this and we say, wow. Swift to hear, and you know, we've all used that or heard it. You got two ears and one mouth for a reason. Anybody ever heard that? You know, well, that's fine. I just wrote that, but that's okay. And so, so anger, and I won't get into the trying to pronounce the Greek words, but their anger and wrath are different. Um, anger, if you go, and that's the thing about our, our English words, we mush everything together. But if you take them apart and really study where they came from, anger is a lingering, seething emotion. <sighs> It's like, you know, it's like simmering. None of you have ever had this, but if you do, you'll know it. And you see that person. Kennedy, you know what I'm talking about. He's back there. He can't see him. And then, if you let that go too long and don't release it through prayer and reading God's word, wrath shows up. Now, you can hide anger a little bit. We were like, what's wrong with that? What's wrong? But you can't hide wrath. Because wrath is an outward expression, that sudden burst of passionate anger, which is a blaze of temper which flares in the violent words or deeds. And it's like a napalm bomb that cuts through people around you. And other people are like, whoa, what's, what are they, you know? So, and you know, through a, ca a casual conversation, intellectually presented, you could maybe justify anger. You can say, if it's the proper for a reason. But wrath, that's hard. Because people, you, you know, you're, you're out there with, you're, you're, you're tap smacking, and you're not swacking the ground. You're smacking it. Get in the way. I got my wrath going, you know. Well, it's not me. Well, then get out of the way, you know. Just me, not you. Y'all have never experienced this, but you've heard about it. Of course, if you're like many Christians, many believers, they say, well, I'm going to justify my anger. That's our first thing. We justify it, even after the fact. Before we get to the place where we ask someone to forgive us, we justify it. Yeah, I got a right to be angry. He cut me off. You see how close he was? And I came from a long a line in my family of anger. My father was the angriest man I've ever met to this day. And thankfully, he, he accepted the Lord late in life. And I got to spend a short time with him afterwards. And he was changed. In fact, he was so concerned when he accepted the Lord. You've heard, I'll just give you the cliff notes. He stopped me in the middle of the salvation prayer and said, what's going to happen if after I pray this, give my life to God, and then I get my, mad at your mother, what am I supposed to do? He was concerned. And I told him, I said, Dad, just do what I do when I, get, when I, when I get mad at Will. Just get on your knees and beg. No, I, say, I said, just ask God to forgive you, and then ask Mom to forgive you. And he looked at me and said, I can do that. And we finished the prayer. He was concerned because he knew this was his Achilles heel, this temper thing. And so... We understand that we're going to have times where we're going to be, there's going to be something. I don't know what your, where your Achilles is in this, but there's something in your life that gets you angry, that gets to a place where you begin to justify it. Most of the time, 99.9% .9 of the time, if I'm justifying my behavior, it's because deep down I know it's wrong. Not every time, but, you know, I'm giving it, you know what I'm, you know, see what I'm saying? It's kind of like sin. Um, the way we pick at you. I'll tell, let's do this. We do, we've done this once or twice before over the last five years. We'll do it again today. Think of what, what's the worst sin you can think of. Take a minute. Just think of your worst, the worst sin you can think of. Not your, the, now I'm going to go out on a limb here and say, I'll bet it's not a sin you struggle with. You know? And yet, really, that's the only thing the Holy Spirit can do anything about with you. You can't, you know what I'm saying? That's, the only, that's why we're here. We're here to present ourselves to the, before the Word of God and His Holy Spirit and let God change us, not our neighbor, not our spouse. We can't think about that. Pray for them, but we, that's up to them. Amen? 
So when we think about things that we justify anger, we say, well, yeah, what you, hey, you overreacted. You got it. That was, now, me, when I get angry, that, and we start to give reasons. You see it a lot when you do uh, marriage counseling, not pre-marriage counseling. All you see is coo-coo, whip-de-doo in, mar- in pre-marriage counseling. In post-marriage counseling, in pre-marriage counseling, they sit like this. In post-marriage counseling, they sit like this. So we get these three simple commands. If you, if you had a little mini devotion, it's three things. One, be swift to hear. Two, be slow to speak. Three, be slow to wrath. There's your challenge. Okay, let's go eat. Let's beat the Baptist of the white meat one Sunday. Let's pray and go. Except that that wouldn't be a good exegesis of Scripture because we have to find out, why did God get gets angry? And we know God cannot sin. So I can just like, God gets angry, I can get angry. But there's a difference in most cases. Because, you know, God cannot sin, and because he cannot sin, when he gets angry, it's right. And here's the other thing. Now, get ready to be shocked. Are you ready to be shocked? God ne- cannot sin, but Pastor Steve can. <sighs> I know, Tama. Please. Please. I know. I've devastated you. I do try not to sin around Tama. I don't know if she has that effect on me, so that's amazing. I mean, <laughs> filth, no problem. But Tama... I hope it probably works with Phil too. <laughs> That's good. So anyway, we're not going to do that. We're going to look at anger. Anger is that lingering, seething emotion. And wrath is a sudden burst of passionate anger, exposing it. God gets angry because the Bible says in Romans, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in, un- in unrighteousness. God gets angry at unrighteousness. Now remember, he's perfect. So he, can never, he never messes up. We can mess up even if we're thinking we're doing it right, but we mess up because we're not perfect in how we discern what's going on. I remember what I said. We say we're angry at sin, but we never make our sin the most important sin. You know, that's the sin we should be most angry at. The sin that we allow in our lives, besetting sin. Sin that, it, Paul, that in, entangles us. Let's get angry at that sin. Let's linger tonight at the altar and when we're here, and, or just come during praise and stand before God and say, God, cleanse me again. Wash me whiter than snow again. Wouldn't that be cool if during worship tonight, by the way, this isn't in my notes, I'm not trying to get, that you just find yourself the altar saying, Lord, in your presence, take it, dip me again, wash me again, amen? Responding because we say, I am so angry at the unrighteousness in my life, because God is. That's what his word says. So we know God gets angry. But God's anger is always reaction to evil. Not to, so when he sees evil, he reacts to it. Isaiah says, who justifies the wicked for a bribe and takes away justice from the righteous man? God does it. He says, he gets angry at the evil of this world. And he, so, and he plants ambassadors, once they're redeemed, all throughout the world to bring hope and life and truth to where our unrighteousness is. And do you know who those ambassadors are? I'm looking at them. Once you're redeemed, you're redeemed to be planted strategically at American Axel, at, at the high school, at, at, uh, on sports teams. You're planted there to be, to, to be light in a dark place. God's wrath, unlike mine, is never misguided. It's never misdirected. He never regrets it afterwards because it's, it's not a selfish anger. It's a righteous anger. And we know that God's display of anger, and this is where we get in trouble, God's display of anger and wrath does not necessarily, in fact, I would say most of the time, justify ours. Unless you're completely linked up in tune with the Holy Spirit, and you, can, you know in your heart it's about others and not you, it doesn't justify my anger. Just because God gets for me to react in such a way, because God's perfect. He gets to do it. I don't. He always wants us, he always wants us to deal with, First, with the things in our life. That's why he says, you know, spend some time with the beam before you go hunting a speck. It takes a long time to move a beam. It takes a short time to move a speck. Now, he doesn't say forget about the speck. But, you know, if I have a speck in my eye, and you say, oh, Pastor, let me help you, and you come walking to me with a beam in yours, I'm going to get, get, I mean, I don't want you close to me with that beam coming out of your eye. And so we need to be working on that. See, I'm not, I'm not preaching a message against anger at all occasions. I'm just saying we've got to run that process through the Holy Spirit. We've got to make sure that we're not, it's not just selfishness on our part. And how it manifests is so important. Jesus, he gets angry. Again, if you're hearing this thing saying, good, check, 
Jesus, I'm going to be like Jesus to be like Jesus. No, not because watch. Jesus get, he got angry at the money changer, changers, didn't he? What a story. I mean, and by the way, Jesus didn't get like Jesus he anger like you see in some of the movies. He's flipping tables. He's letting birds out of cage. In other words, doves. I mean, sometimes I see this kind of um, sissified up. I see him taking those tables and throwing them all around. The, I mean, he made a ruckus because of the, what was happening. They were ripping off the people coming to worship and to pay their temple tax, ripping them off. There was a lot of corruptness going there. And so what does that say? You know when Jesus gets angry? Oh, yeah, he's angry at the sins of the world, but here's where he gets angry. Stay with me. When it invades the church. When it invades the leadership of the church and is accepted by the church. You want to see Jesus get mad? That's when Jesus gets mad. It's easy for us to rail against, you know, the perversions of the world, and I mean, they're wrong and they're sinful, but it always starts. Judgment starts where? Where does judgment start? In the house of God. And then if you say that you're going to make it, judgment starts in the house of God, but really you can place your hands over your heart and say, judgment starts in my heart. I'm part of this house of God, aren't you? Whether, whether your home church is in Arkansas or in Buchanan or whatever, but you're here today, we're part of the house of God. Remember the house, then my other house is uh, on uh, Truman Drive, and then the church house, and then we have the kingdom of God, the world, the, the kingdom of God. We're all part of the house. It starts with the Christians. What has hurt our witness in the world is that we've, been, we've, worried, we've railed against the world without taking care of our own backyard. We lost the high road by allowing people who had open lifestyle sins move into places of leadership and influence. We lost the authority there. But Jesus got mad. He said, I'm gonna, I don't care who they are. In the, in the, well, they're the big shots. He goes in there, and he's, they were selling ox and sheep and dove and ripping them off, and he takes out, and by the way, if he'd have stopped at the tables, we'd have known he was mad. How many of you say, if somebody's flipping over tables, you know they're mad? But then, you're going to have to just hear this, kids. He takes out a, uh, I'm going to say, it says cords, but it's like a cat of nine tails. It wasn't enough to turn their stuff upside down. Are you ready? I've got to, let me show, no, I'll show you. He starts whipping them. I'd be like, I don't know who this guy is. Where's the Jesus that I didn't hear about? I mean, this is, this is an angry Jesus. Hey, we need to embrace all the scriptures, don't we? Not just the stuff, that, not just the hugs and kisses. Now, if you think that as a parent, pastor said, I'm going to be like Jesus. My kids are getting a whipping. Remember, Jesus' motives are always pure, and he's always perfect. And I came from a, 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 a family of, you know, my father would be in jail today. And in fairness to him, he, taught, he did what his dad did. There was no focus on the family. His focus was on my fanny, not the family. Yet he had a moral code because he never spanked the girls. And if you meet my sister, you think, well, maybe he should have spanked at least a couple of times. You know? <laughs> I, I never spanked. Okay, knock it off. Jesus, but he also, he zeroed in just, not just from the body, but he zeroed in on the leadership again, and he, he got so mad at the Pharisees. Can you blame him? I mean, these people, they made it harder for people to get to God. They, they, he waited, they waited them down. They gave all these rules that were, were not God's rules. They made it harder to prove themselves worthy to be in God's presence. You know what I said? Shame on them. We're, listen, in New Hope, we want to make it easier for people to come to church so they can hear the word. When I say I want the perversion and the, the, all the different letters here in church, I mean it. I want them in church. We can't have this push away attitude. We need, they need to hear the gospel. We can't let them influence other people. But if they want to come and sit, and I mean, I don't even know, I'm not trying to be, I don't know how many letters there are now. Just when you think you got the letters down, they add letters. But they need Jesus. And thereby the grace of God goes us. I mean, there's probably some letter. That could apply to where you'd be without Christ. I know I, know I have a letter, and my letter's L, and it's not for lesbian. It's lost. I would be lost. 
Man, I was so into myself, but I had so much ambition in the wrong area. If I had not come back to Christ, I don't know, I'd be, I'd be singing Tom Jones songs to some smoky Sheridan with a seven-foot ceiling and a, uh, you know, a track tape, you know? No, it's not happening, and you can't come. I mean, you know, you're lost is lost. We would all go lost in another direction. And the people that I've mentioned, are, they're lost. But you and I would be lost without Jesus, too. We wouldn't be unlikely to go in some of those. But you'd have a direct, so would I. Lost is lost. When you're lost, you don't even, a lot of lost, they don't even know they're lost. Some do because we experience pain, but that's why we need to show, this is a lighthouse. New Hope, if I could change the name, I don't want to, but a lighthouse. This is a lighthouse. We're saying, Bring us your broken ships. Bring us your hurt people. We want, and so we can't act like we don't like. Listen, if someone thinks you don't like them, they're not going to receive what you have or don't even love them. Why would they come to a place where they're not loved? It's a challenge. So that's why we need the word to change our minds on some things. Not, not condoning. Not ever condoning. It takes the Holy Spirit. But you can embrace without condoning. But the Pharisees, whew, I mean, Jesus is throwing the woes at them. Woe, you scribes. Woe, you hypocrites. You shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. Woe, 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 you hypocrites. I mean, he's just, you devour widows' houses. You pretend fake long prayers. You're going to receive greater condemnation. This is Jesus. He's not happy. Dare say he's angry. Travel land and see it goes, I'm not going to read the whole thing. Is, do we even have it? We don't have it up here, do we? Yeah, well, we'll take it several slides. But you, gotta you should read this sermon, guys. Matthew chapter 23. I mean, he's just pounding. Most, most people in church wouldn't, wouldn't listen to that today if Jesus was speaking. I mean, you'd be like, hey, I ain't putting up with this. But he closes with, even so you also hourly appear righteous to men, but inside you're full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. I used to read that and I'd see the end, but I... This last time I saw the, it, the, don't miss this part. You outwardly appear righteous. In other words, you got really good at being a church person, but you're not a Christian. Some of us got, can get really good at being a church person, but we're not a Christian. I'd rather work with people that are, I mean, I don't want them to struggle, but who struggle and say, Pastor, help me. I'm people who text me at, late at night and say, what does this verse mean? I'm messing, what is it? In other words, they're not, we know they're struggling, but they're, help! Then a person's like, Bow your hearts, uh, you leave the sanctuary, not spiritual renewal. Class thespian, 1974. Yes, they had acting back then. <laughs> so, unlike God, when he shows up, when God shows up angry, when Jesus shows up angry, we don't have to wonder. It's, it's, it's God. We don't have to wonder. You don't have to say, ooh, is he, what's going on here? Get angry at what he gets angry. Because, listen, number three, because of our imperfections, we must be slow to wrath. God doesn't need to be slow to wrath. We need to be slow to wrath. Very slow. And if you have any question or wondering how you should, get some help. Let somebody speak into your life who loves you and loves the person you maybe that you're angry at or going to react God's perfect and all-knowing. He gets to respond like that. He gets to react. I'm supposed to consider, absorb, and then act, not react. Isn't it true? You've heard me say this if you've been here any length of time. Most of the time as I look back when I messed up, it was because I reacted to something instead of acted. Anybody like me? I don't want to be like pastor. No, you don't. I mean, hopefully in some areas, but. You react and then, oh, uh, or you react because you only know a little bit. Anybody ever react because you know just a little bit of it? And then you find that the other you're like, oh, what do I do now? <laughs> Where do I go now? As I look over my whatever amount of years, I was it over 43 years we've been doing this with youth and everything mixed together, and there have been times where I reacted and I thought I was justified. Because you don't react if you don't think you're justified. If you're reacting and you don't think you're justified, you're a loon. We just quickly justified and bang. And then we find out different information. 
or that we're reacting and we think it's this person, this precious little blonde girl, we think it's her, and so we, react, we find out it's your mother. <laughs> I mean, they sort of look alike. Yes, they are. As you can see how I got in trouble with that. But you know, you know what I mean? I've been there. Oh, and even thinking about it now, even Mike, even preaching this message, I get little pangs of regret, like, oh, wow, I wish I would have waited. I wish I would have waited. God doesn't have to wait. So God's perfect at all knowing, but here's a news flash. You're not. I'm not. So this should cause us to say, Lord, give me the patience. A lot of times when we lose our temper, it's really a lack of patience, by the way. But give me the patience to hold back, have some restraint, Trust you. Now, there's, I mean, if somebody's on the roof of the church, I'm going to get them off. You know what I mean? There's times we have, ah, get in. You know, because, we, you know, ah, that's not tongues. That's me getting you off the roof. You know, but if while you're up there, if you could clean the steeple, I mean, that's not even a steeple, just the top of a steeple. And while you're up there, clean it. But then get off. I don't like to see your kids crawling around the roof after church. That's what happened. I said, Natalie, get off the roof. And it was, it was her mother. It can happen, though. Don't, don't look at me like that. We need to put a camera here and put it on my wife once in a while and see what I'm going through trying to preach these messages. So let's act, not react. Let's start there. God help me, help us to be people who act and don't react. Because quite honestly, unlike Jesus, Meryl, Sue, well, that's enough. Unlike Jesus, our anger is often a reaction to our own self-interest. We might be good at broadening it out, but deep down, it's our self-interest. That's never God. God. God is, can we trust God to take care of our interests so we don't have to be so enamored with our own self-interest? Can we trust him? Wouldn't that be a start? Where we don't have to get up, you know, this is what my wife always says when I, when I, when I get, you know, my father was a, and this is when I was really young, so I don't know what happened later, but. It seemed like anybody who drove a little faster than my dad was a maniac. Look at that maniac. And anybody who drove a little slower was a what? You remember? Huh? It wasn't a swear word. No, it wasn't a swear. So you got he thought so he would react all the time. So a car ride with my dad was eventful. And so later on in life, I found out, and I, I can't tell you what it was, but that when I would be frustrated by someone driving 54 in a 55 for 50 miles in the lane, that I had names for, uh, not swear word names, not like my dad, but I had names, didn't I, son, for those lunatics who would be driving, you know, deal breakers. And, and that's really one of the only names I can tell you from the pulpit, but if you ask me later, I won't tell you then either, so. Our self-interest gets employed. When God, when we use God for anger and wrath, it's never about his self-interest. It's oftentimes about our self-interest. Like, just remember, here's, here's a good rule of thumb. Check this out. When Jesus was most abused to where he could have got angry, remember he was innocent, never sinned, and they were... This is going to be a challenge. If you're, if you're struggling at all this, man, this is where it really hits. He, did, he didn't say one word. He's being falsely accused. He's being betrayed. Ah, that's a tough one for me, I've got to tell you. But he's being betrayed. He's being, and he doesn't say one word. You want to be like Jesus? Because that's when it was focused on him. Now, when they were ripping off the people trying to worship God at the moment, he's flipping tables and <laughs> taking out a whip. And we know he could have called 10,000 angels or just stopped the whole thing. We all know that story. But instead, he doesn't say a word. What a challenge that is. And Peter writes it this way. For the, to this you recall, because in chapter 2, 1 Peter, Christ also suffered for us. Listen to this. Leaving us an example. Everybody say example. So he suffered for us. And now here's the example. Catch this. That you should follow in his steps. Stay with me. Who committed no sin, nor was a deceit found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return, and when he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself who judged righteously. He didn't, when he was in it. And that's our example, Peter says. 
And God if you, knows if you, certainly before the Lord, if you study Peter's life or mine, you'll see that he had trouble with following that principle in his life. It got better after he got baptized in the Holy Spirit. But he still got, Paul still had to correct him on some things where he sat to eat, things he had to do. See, this is a lifelong process of sanctification. I don't want you to leave here discouraged. Some of you have been on this track a long time, and you could say, let, admit to me, Pastor, I'm here, you know, I have bouts with this too. There's no magic wand here. It's a daily grind. It's embracing God's word. It's saying, Jesus, I love you. Hanging on. Even after you mess up, you fess up, and you get up. And get those hands up. You don't give up. You leave here today and you blow your stack tonight, just know that it was brought out by the Holy Spirit to show you that Miller knows what he's talking about. So what's our lessons learned? As you know, lessons learned mean we're in the last lap here. So if you're a musician and, and we have 15 of them going to the platform, go now. If it's just Joel, you go too. I'd rather you be there. Is it just you? Thank God. Let's, let's thank God for that. Amen. I love all my musicians, but sometimes it sounds like a herd of buffalo is going up there when I'm trying to pray. Right? I'm going to know what I'm talking about. You ever try to close the sermon with prayer and you got... <laughs> no, not poor Joel. Hey, back when I started ministry, we, all the preachers had to sit up here the whole time and stare at the back of the head or the back of something, up, just at the back of the preacher the whole sermon. Couldn't pick your nose, you couldn't adjust your hair, you couldn't do anything. You just sat there. And in one church, I was there for three services. So I'm hearing the sermon for the third time and how to act interested. And sometimes the first time wasn't very good either, but I still had to act. Amen. He knows. Not here, though. What's he talking about? I'm trying to put a few chuckles in because I know this is the kind of message that's going to get in there. But God help us. If I could shorten the regret, if I could lessen the regrets of things that have happened, when I've reacted poorly, or I acted in anger selfishly, the, the rest of my 30 years here on earth are going to be better. I'm going to be a better witness. I'm going to have a better impact. The people around me are going to receive me more. Yeah, and you too, by the way. This is to be the desire of the heart of every believer. And if you find yourself knowing that I'm easy going and fun, I never get it. Great. But something could come down the track that could derail you. So this is a time that you get your convictions deep. I want to use the scripture, so why don't you go ahead and close your eyes, and you can trust me. I don't know. It's up there, but we can give it to you if you need it. But Ephesians 4, Paul jumps in here. This is why I want you to see that Paul and James are not at odds, that the scriptures don't cancel each one out. You don't have to pick one or the other. Here's what, here's what he says to the church in Ephesus. Be angry, but do not sin. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Don't give place to the devil. Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands. It was good. Let no, watch this. Let no corrupt word come out of your mouth. That's connected to anger. That's when we do it most of the time. But only what is good for edification, that it may impart grace to the hearer. When somebody makes you angry, Paul's saying, impart grace. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit, by whom you were sealed to the day of redemption. Now watch this. In doing so, let all bitterness, wrath, there's anger right in the middle of those two, clamor, evil speaking, be put away from you with all malice. You see, lesson, as we go on our lessons learned, number one, anger is the gateway to all sorts of sin. Anger is what's going on inside, but look what comes out. We slash, we say hateful things, we, some of you cuss, you, you know, you just, what is that? That's because you let anger reign instead of God's grace reign. And wrath, let's all be honest. I'm not, here, I'm not just trying to make you feel bad, but if conviction's here, let it hit hard. Wrath cuts deep, and it often causes pain that can take a long time to heal, doesn't it? Long after you've said it, boy, the devil just grabs that and bombards. I think of children who've heard some of the most heinous, horrific things from their parents that begins to model in them and it transfers to their parenting. You know how I feel about that. You don't have to act like your mom and dad. You can use those hurts to go the direct opposite if you'll let the Holy Spirit help you. But the anger is the gateway to all sorts of sin. That's what he says. He talks about don't be angry in sin, and then he lists the sins. Paul does. Think of your regrets for just a second. Things you've said 
or, or reacted in a way to your spouse, your children, your parents, your siblings. Many and most of them were done because of uncontrolled anger, inappropriate anger. Let's see it as the wicked thing that it is. Number three le of uh, lessons learned, our God is love and is slow to anger. That's what the Bible says. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in mercy. Let's be like God. Let's strive. Even if you just could pray, Lord, help me to be more like you. Because as you know, church, there's a price to pay for uncontrolled anger. There's always a price to pay, whether it's our witness or relationship. Proverbs 14 says it this way, and this is my last verse. Whoever is slow to anger has great understanding, but he who has a hasty temper exalts folly and shame. Let me say it again. Whoever is slow to anger has great understanding. Notice it says be slow to anger. It doesn't say that you can't. We've talked about there's a time to be angry. But you want that to be a slow process where you're deciding, is it about me? Is it, is it me reacting or acting? Is it out of love or out of selfishness? Be slow. Be slow. Go slow. You see, what God's word is really saying to us in a sentence, would you stand with me? What God's word is saying to us in a sentence, a sentence is, it's okay to use your temper, but it's not okay to lose your temper. It's okay to use your temper, but not lose it. Because it's not losing at it that you're no longer controlling it. And so are there things to be upset about? Yes. Are there things to get angry about? Absolutely. But we can do it in a way godlike, because we're his representatives. We're little, cr Christian means little Christ. We can do it in a way where we, where we show our displeasure without sinning. We can do it. You can do it. With heads bowed and eyes closed, I'm going to ask you to say, Pastor Steve, I'm here. It doesn't matter whether you're at a 10 or 2, but where you're at, you say, I, will, I feel like the Word of God is true and I can do better, and I want to do better. I want God's Word to saturate how I handle things, and I am asking for the Holy Spirit's help. Would you pray for me? If that's you, slip your hand up and put it up. God bless you. God, okay, well, I'm going to say... I'm going to say that's 70% of the congregation here today. I think the Holy Spirit has proven through that response. Now, if nobody, listen to me, if nobody had raised their hand, God's word is true. If nobody, had, young ministers get all nervous, when, but when it's overwhelming like this, that tells me that the heavy Holy Spirit rests heavy. So I'm going to come to you instead of bring you up here, and I'm going to ask you, put your hand back up just for a second, and say, God, it's me. Thank you for bringing this message to me. Thank you, Lord, that your word is true. Heavenly Father, forgive us for times which we've been inappropriate in our response to things which make us angry. No person can make us angry. Forgive us time that we've chosen to be angry and we've not shown restraint. Holy Spirit, I need your help. I need your help. If, you're, if you feel that way too, say it. I need your help, Holy Spirit. I need your help. And I receive it because you promised you'd give it to me. And God, by your grace... I'm going to be angry and sin not for your glory. And all God's people say it. Now let's thank God that his word is true. Come on, let's thank God he can change us with his word. Hallelujah. Come on, let's do it. No, church, come on, let's be grateful. Hallelujah. Glory to God. We're going to let the, uh, I don't know what song has been chosen, but we're going to let that song be our benediction. God love you. I love you. I expect your testimonies. One day you're going to look back and say, man, I'm handling things so much different than I used to.